Well, the Supreme Court is probably poised, and I say probably with acknowledgement, there is at least one major complication that could prompt the court to toss these cases out, but probably poised to strike down yet another illegal Biden executive action, this time the cancellation of half a trillion dollars in student debt without any clear congressional authorization to do it, The editorial board at the Washington Post is out with what is assuredly something of a deliberately provocative headline. Biden overreached on student loans, but the court shouldn't stop him, which sure reads a lot like, yeah, this is blatantly illegal, but we like it. So carry on. But it's actually an argument that's more complicated than that. Not that there's been any shortage of cheering the destruction of the rule of law so long as we like the ends. But in this case, the Post editorial board actually called Biden's action a regressive, expensive mistake upon its announcement and stands by that position now. So it's not actually just a we like the policy, so do whatever you want argument, at least on its face. Instead, it's an argument that expands upon the core of this case. Fundamentally, this is a case about the separation of powers involving all three branches of government. Obviously, what are the limits of the president creating new interpretations of Congress's intent in existing laws by Biden is attempting to do here, but also what are the limits of court intervention to stop that expansion of executive power? What the Post Board is arguing here is that the dangers of judicial overreach are just as significant as the dangers of executive overreach. In other words, Biden is acting beyond his legal authority, but if those challenging his actions at the Supreme Court lack standing, and if the court were to grant that standing, they'd be acting beyond their legal authority to intervene in the case as well. And the proper solution to overreach is not more overreach. The proper solution, according to the editorial board, is Congress asserting its proper authority and telling Biden to cut it out. That the intent of the law he's citing to do this was never blanket debt cancellation for a majority of borrowers, regardless of personal circumstance. Standing is a principle long maintained in the court system, pursuant to Article 3 of the Constitution. The requirement that anybody challenging a law, or in this case an executive action, have a direct stake in that action, or a direct harm suffered, is itself in place for separation of powers reasons. It's to protect against endless legal challenges on purely ideological grounds and a court system bogged down with political questions that are appropriately resolved in the legislature. After all, warns the Post, we don't want law for the whole country created by nine unaccountable, unelected judges. And on its own, it's not an insane case. From a separation of powers perspective, The problem of a rogue court intervening and invalidating laws from the legislature is the same problem as a rogue president inventing new law. It's one branch stealing proper constitutional authority from another. The insane part, of course, is the people very suddenly and conveniently now discovering this principle. Because this same Washington Post editorial board bemoaned the court returning political power to its proper constitutional jurisdiction mere months ago in the context of abortion. The court conceding power in the way they advocate now, was actually great cause for concern then. The board warned that the court returning this issue to the states to evaluate for themselves has enabled them to evaluate incorrectly with devastating policies that will impact Americans' well-being and livelihoods. So perhaps it is just please, Supreme Court, leave it in place when we like it and strike it down when we don't after all. But of course, it's not the Washington Post editorial board opinion that has the consequence. It's the opinions of the justices that do. And likewise, several of the justices have had a very sudden awakening to the separation of powers principles at stake as well. At Tuesday's hearing for the arguments in both of the sister student debt cancellation cases, Kagan, Sotomayor, and Brown-Jackson all became keenly aware of just how limited their role to intervene should be. I understood that the standing bar really, as applied in a case like this, would allow the political branches to hash this out without 
interference from a torrent of lawsuits brought by states and entities and individuals who don't have a real personal stake in the outcome. There are third parties all the time who have an interest in, gosh, I, I wish that party over there would bring a suit because I have some relationship with that third party and I would like it very much if that third party represented its own interests better, in my view. But we don't do that. We don't allow that kind of interference with the decision of the entity involved to decide whether the harm is of the kind that, uh, that they want to sue for. That really has us, as the third branch of government, changing Congress's words because we don't think we like what's happening. And what you're saying is now we're going to give judges the right to decide how much aid to give them. Instead of the person with the expertise and the experience, the Secretary of Education, who's been dealing with educational issues and the problems surrounding student loans, we're going to take it upon ourselves instead of leaving that decision in the hands of the person who has experience with these questions. Sotomayor is a step beyond even. She's not just saying that the court shouldn't intrude upon the president or upon Congress. She's saying that the court should intrude upon the expert class. Who could question the wisdom of one guy to handle the financial affairs of millions of people? It's not exactly constitutional reasoning, but then again, constitutional reasoning isn't exactly what Sotomayor is known for either. Because after all, the education secretary is indeed a wise Latino, if not a wise Latina. So I guess Sotomayor is perfectly consistent on that philosophy. Anyway, the point is, it is richly ironic to hear lectures about judicial restraint from the same people who were frothing for judicial control of political questions mere months ago. Today it's, oh, the court should be very careful about overstepping its boundaries. Of course, yesterday on the abortion issue, returning that political question to the states where it properly belongs, considering the Constitution is silent on that issue, that was a threat to the entire constitutional order of the country. When they disliked the political outcome in that case, they wrote with sorrow, their word, not mine, sorrow about their inability to intervene, not praise for the wisdom of restraint from seizing court power. Now, in fairness, of course, Katanji Brown Jackson did not. She was not yet on the court at the time, but if she had been, I will speculate comfortably that her name would have been listed right there next to Kagan and Sotomayor's warning of imminent constitutional doom for the women she can't define. But the hypocrisy and ideological inconsistency aside, even if I take it as valid and sincere, this argument creates a serious paradox. In the name of upholding the separation of powers, we should accept a breach of the separation of powers. That's what it breaks down to, assuming you accept the Washington Post's position that Biden doesn't have the legal authority to do this because no law from Congress actually authorizes it. But that is where these justices actually go a step beyond the Post. For this trio, it's not actually Biden overstepping Congress. Congress explicitly authorized this, actually. This is exactly what Congress meant 20 years ago when they wrote a law about helping military members during wartime, at least according to Kagan. All this business about executive power, I mean, we worry about executive power when Congress hasn't authorized the use of executive power. Here, Congress has authorized the use of executive power in an emergency situation. To believe this blanket debt cancellation was Congress's intent under the law cited, you have to squint even harder with a magnifying glass even bigger than the one they used to find their constitutional right to an abortion. She acts like it's a plain and straightforward reading. It plainly is not. Congress passed the HEROES Act in 2003. This is what Biden and the Education Department are citing as the legal authority for their action in this case. The law's stated purpose is to assist military members during wartime. But beyond the general purpose of this law having nothing to do with the specific circumstances in which it is now invoked, the list of things you have to accept to apply this law to blanket debt cancellation because of COVID is long and ridiculous. Yes, it's true the law cites quote-unquote national emergency as a potential reason for action by the Department of Education, but we have to accept that COVID in August 2022 
qualifies as such an emergency. When the spread is statistically over, when the vaccines have been available for a year and a half to anybody who wants them, when all restrictions are either gone or are phasing out, not tightening in a way that would complicate debt repayment. We have to believe that when Congress wrote about people in specific areas affected by disasters with specific financial circumstances, they actually meant anybody, anywhere, at any time. We have to believe that when the law mentions its purpose of helping those affected by specific circumstances avoid falling behind on their debt or default, this relief should include borrowers who, by their own description, are not at risk of such things. As the government acknowledges, Didn't half the borrowers say they would not have any trouble paying their loans without regard to the forgiveness program? I mean, if more than half the people say they don't need this relief, extending relief to that breadth certainly raises questions. And even if we accept that some borrowers are in financial trouble, we have to believe that the statutory language that says the Department of Education can modify or waive certain loan provisions to ensure the borrower is not put in a worse position by national emergency, as in pausing repayment until things normalize. Instead, that means outright cancellation of the debt to put the borrower in a better position financially. And we have to do this despite statutory language that implies the debt continues post-modification. It seems to me that that language in relation to that financial assistance suggests that the relationship would continue, but the waiver or modification here severed the relationship to the debt so that it no longer exists. Doesn't the statutory language in relation to that financial assistance presuppose an ongoing relationship that might be modified, but not completely ended? We have to believe that debt cancellation because of COVID is exactly what Congress meant despite the fact that debt cancellation for actual war, which is what Congress wrote about, never even happened at all. Never before has the HEROES Act been used to forgive a single loan. If debt cancellation is Congress's obvious intent, then why didn't that obvious intent ever happen for the people Congress was actually writing about, primarily members of the military. But just because you or I may not accept these premises doesn't mean that we can get help from the court. That is where these cases might hit a fatal obstacle. You can't have standing unless you are directly harmed. But the harm in a case like this, extra legislatively piling on the national debt, is a very broad and general one. The taxpayer is harmed by the saddling of that debt. The citizen is harmed by the creation of new law out of thin air outside of the constitutional process. But the trouble is the courts say, even if the harm is very broad and general, the people bringing the challenge to court can't be. As a matter of court precedent and tradition, standing must be more specific to protect against unjustified court intervention. And in this case, several justices express skepticism that either party challenging Biden has that standing. The state of Missouri is claiming standing through its state-created loan servicer Mohila, but Mohila is an independently operated entity that is not in court to challenge the move itself by its own choosing. In the sister case, two borrowers sued because they are not eligible for forgiveness and by denial of the usual procedural requirements necessary to give them a chance to advocate for a different program that could theoretically be to their benefit, they are harmed, they say. But that's also somewhat flimsy according to the court's standing standards. But for those justices who appear likely to reject the standing of the challengers and end the case there, their solution is not tough, nothing you can do, necessarily. As the Post editorial board advocates and Kagan describes, their solution is Congress should clarify its intent. You know, you might think that Congress made a wrong call there, but that's Congress's call. And in pure principle, I don't actually disagree. I just disagree on what should be the default if Congress doesn't act. Assuming we constitutionally accept the existence of the Department of Education and this loan program, which is a big assumption, but that is the status quo. And in that world, Congress does hold the ultimate authority here, not the president, not the courts. But the problem with this theory that Kagan and the Post Board are advancing is that where there's ambiguity in Congress's intent, it's saying we should default to 
The president can do whatever he wants until he's overridden by a veto-proof congressional supermajority as long as he has some loosely plausible statutory language to point to. But with over 60,000 pages of U.S. code to work with, well, that's no obstacle or check on power at all. Just put your army of lawyers on it. Eventually, you'll find something loosely related enough to be sufficient. So sure, when in doubt, kick it back to Congress. But kicking it back to Congress does not mean that the president has presumed power until Congress says otherwise, because the president only gets his power from two places, the Constitution or Congress itself. If the president is not clearly authorized by either, well, that means it's Congress's job and nobody else's. And constitutionally speaking, that means an end to this program until there is clarity, not its continuation until Congress says no, because the presumption is not presidential power until Congress says no. The presumption is no presidential power until Congress says yes. And that ending of the program probably is what will happen in this case. There is some fracturing among the justices outside of usual ideological lines, but listening to the questioning, it's likely this move is defeated. Barrett's questioning on standing appeared somewhat aligned with the liberals who would reject the case on that basis, but there's no clear fifth vote to stop the case there. If the case is then evaluated on the merits, Kavanaugh asks some questions that may imply he might accept the premise that the president has statutory authority to do this, but even if he does, again, there's no clear fifth vote to join the liberals. If five justices agree that the standing in these cases is legitimate, and five justices agree that the president exceeded his statutory authority, then student debt cancellation is dead. It's already on pause for now while these court cases are resolved. The court's decision is expected by the end of June. But to Kagan, Sotomayor, and Brown Jackson, though, I say welcome to the club. I'm glad we all now apparently agree on the general principle that the branches of government should be strictly limited to their constitutional constraints, even if your theory on that principle in practice is that the president should be able to do pretty much whatever he wants until Congress actually gets around to doing anything about it. It's no principle at all. It's just lip service to it in pursuit of the exact opposite, actually. Justices who would happily cram down their policy preferences in any context otherwise suddenly find restraint from intervention when the president exercises that force for them. How very convenient, but in its own strange way, how paradoxically consistent, too. The only principle is the power, of course. The explanations otherwise are just for entertainment. And I certainly don't blame you if you say they're not even that. Thanks, as always, for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Minds. That is at M L. Christensen. You're always welcome to come out and chat in my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Goodbye.